National Park Rangers were searching for a missing person when they made an unexpected discovery. While searching around the Grand Canyon for Gabor Bertzi Tomskani, who was described as being a Hungarian national who lived in Hong Kong, the team found another individual. The park ranger had discovered Scott Walsh. Those who found him said he was last seen stepping off a shuttle bus at the park's south side. The park rangers and investigators said the clothing on the individual matched what Scott was wearing that day, but did say that Scott was positioned in such a way that it was pretty much undetectable. Spokeswoman Joelle Baird said the following, It happens every once in a while here during searches that we end up finding people we weren't expecting. Park rangers and crew said that at the time they were looking for Gabor, with police in Las Vegas saying that the individual was reported as missing, and this was around the same time that Gabor was travelling around the southwest of the US. The investigators were able to track down his location due to finding his car in a Grand Canyon parking lot, with them saying they found this in mid-August, and ended up finding him a few days later 430 feet inside a canyon. Authorities involved in the investigation said that Gabor likely passed away due to the fall, but at the time said that further investigations are being conducted. Scott Walsh was discovered during an aerial search of the area, with park rangers saying that he was found 600 feet below the Pipe Creek Overlook, and this was over three miles away from where they'd found his day bag. Spokeswoman Joelle Baird said the following, The fact that he was found was just coincidental. We weren't necessarily looking for him, and he wasn't a person that was really on our radar. Park rangers said that Scott Walsh wasn't reported to the park as missing in 2015, and so investigations were never carried out. Investigators have said that it's important that people speak up and report those who are missing, detailing that the vast majority of people are found within 24 hours, with them saying that this equals to around 80%, but also said that once the 24 hour mark is passed, the chances of missing people surviving dramatically decreases. Park officials said he lived in Ecuador, and that they were able to identify him because of his day pack and also the prescriptions that had his name on them. The ranger also found a jacket that had inside of it a driver's license. Missing People, a charity that helps both the disappeared and those left behind, has reported that 250,000 missing people are reported each year, with other websites saying the number is closer to 350,000. On the 4th of July back in 2012, in the small town of Seward, Alaska, the 97th annual marathon race known as the Mount Marathon was well underway when one of the runners, a man by the name of Paul Michael Lemaitre, appeared to have suddenly vanished while standing out in the middle of a crowd of fellow runners. Regarded as one of the most bizarre and unexplainable disappearances of Alaska, Mount Marathon officials have been struggling to answer the cause of the disappearance of Paul Michael, and how it would have been possible for one of the most experienced runners to have vanished while taking a routine exercise through a known area. According to the missing report, Paul Michael was 66 years old at the time of his disappearance, and was considered to be one of the most experienced runners of the event. Even more peculiar, the Mount Marathon race is considered to be one of the oldest and most safest races across the United States, with the marathon first beginning back in 1915 without a single known injury or disappearance. No one had vanished in the 97 years since its conception. The marathon is described as being a three-mile combination run that takes runners up Seward, Alaska's highest point of elevation, of 3,000 feet before coming back down to the base of elevation at sea level. The starting point of the race begins within downtown of Seward, located at the corner of 4th Avenue and Adams Street, winds up to the nearby mountain summit, and winds back down to the end corner of the 4th Avenue and Washington Street. After spending the entire year preparing for the race, Paul told his family that he planned on taking his time with the race, hoping to only get a respectable time in placing, 
and not concerning himself for racing against the other runners and possibly hurting himself. Considering the fact that Paul is described as being incredibly physically fit by his co-workers at the military joint base Elmendorf Richardson, it seemed likely to his family that he would be able to finish the race with a solid time. Additionally, the fact that Paul Michael worked as a counsellor at the military base, focused on helping guys leaving the military reintegrate into civilian life, assisting with health and preparing for every possible problem that might occur, helps to demonstrate that Paul was known for being thoroughly prepared for any situation he might have found himself in, as well as the fact that had he been suffering from any form of illness, he would have received the proper help he needed. Unfortunately for Paul, Shortly after registering for the Mount Marathon race and receiving his bib number 548, any son of him would completely disappear off the face of the earth only a few hours after the race began. According to the official search and rescue timeline, it was around 3pm that Paul Michael's family claimed to have last seen him as he was standing at the starting line. Several hours later, sometime around 6pm, an official race timing crew had spotted Paul Michael ascending the mountain and decided to do a short interview with him to be used in the article for the race later in the day. Given the fact that he appeared to have been in great shape and quite talkative, the lead timer asked Paul several questions concerning the difficulty of the race and how he felt. Paul, without hesitation, stated he was feeling great and was hoping to finish the race in the next few hours at a brisk walking pace. Five days later, on the 9th of July, the officials at the race would publish the following article surrounding the encounter. According to the chamber, a race timing crew stationed at the top of the mountain began its descent at around 5.45pm. The lead timer, who was not named in the statement, spoke with Paul at around 6pm when he was nearing the mountain top. The timer had reported that Paul verbally confirmed that he wanted to continue. He looked good and did not demonstrate any sign of distress or physical or emotional concern, and was moving slowly and steadily up the mountain. After reviewing the segment, it was believed that Paul was the last runner to reach the mountain. It should have been within view of a group of other runners and officials watching over the race. Several minutes after Paul was last seen by the race timing crew, a bizarre accident would take place on the descent of the mountain trail, though few details surrounding the event are known. According to official reports, two runners had fallen in an area that caused them to have suffered from serious injuries, though the extent of the injuries are not known. Worried about losing their proud history of maintaining one of the safest races, the Chamber of Commerce of Seward immediately began investigating the area, but were unable to find a sufficient answer for why the runners bizarrely turned off into a random area and seemed to have jumped from the mountain's ledge. The two runners, having suffered injuries at two separate locations in two different incidents, were unable to remember why they'd fallen in the given areas. It was around 8pm when Paul's wife contacted the race officials, and let them know that Paul had not come back from the run, and was expected to be the only runner left on the trail. She then explained that Paul had been expected to finish the race at around 7.30pm, and was running more than 30 minutes late than his expected finishing time. Due to the strange nature of the previous runner's injuries, the race officials did not hesitate another moment, and contacted the Seward Fire Department, and the Alaska State Troopers to begin an immediate search of the mountain to locate Paul, and return him safely to his family. Oddly enough, despite several hundred volunteers working over the course of the next several hours, checking every pathway of the mountain, the teams were unable to locate any son of Paul. Even after employing the use of helicopters equipped with special thermal imaging and FLIR cameras, no discoveries were made. Oddly enough, the search teams claimed that as soon as they were dispatched in the area, a sudden heavy fog blanketed the entire mountain. Throughout the search, the teams came across two black bears that ran away at the sound of people, but no other form of wildlife was seen in the area. 
after a team of search and rescue dogs were following Paul's scent, but then suddenly seemed to lose it halfway down the mountain. Search and rescue efforts were strained beyond their limits, and no new ideas to help recover Paul were available. On the 9th of July back in 2012, the local newspaper The Alaska Dispatch ran an article that described the search efforts with the following paragraph. Hundreds of volunteers have been involved in the rescue operation, including the Alaska Mountain Rescue, Nordic Ski Patrol, Alaska Search and Rescue Dogs, Bear Creek Volunteer Fire Department, National Park Service, Seward Police and Fire Department, the Air National Guard, Alaska State Troopers, and many Seward residents, as well as racers who returned to Seward to help with the surge. No son of Paul Michael was found over the week's surge, and to this day no one knows what could have happened to the runner. The official explanation behind Paul's disappearance claims that Paul was ascending the mountain late into the night. His poor eyesight may have caused him to confuse the running pathway with a previous year's running pathway, as the Mount Marathon race was known for changing its path every year to provide veterans with a new challenge, and could have caused him to run off the side of the mountain in a dangerous area where his body has not yet been found. The Mysterious Disappearance and Discovery of Dr. James McGrogan 39-year-old Dr. James McGrogan visited the ski resort of the small town of Vail, located at the base of the Vail Mountain, within the White River National Forest for a weekend getaway vacation trip, with three of his other friends. It was on Friday the 14th of March of 2014 that Dr. James McGrogan would go missing for a time span of around two weeks before his body was recovered on the 3rd of April by a group of young skiers. According to Dr. James McGrogan's friends, the group went hiking up the Vale Mountain, taking the nine-mile hike to the Eisman Hut at around 8.30 in the morning. After a couple of hours at around 10 in the morning, the group took a short break at the side of the trail to catch their breath and relax. It was at this point that Dr. James McGrogan told his friends he would hike on alone, and would meet them at the Eisman Hut when they were finished relaxing. Several hours later when the group made it to the Eisman Hunt, they noticed that Dr. James McGrogan was nowhere to be found, with the search and rescue team spending the next two weeks trying to find him, and claiming to have covered a more than 18 square mile area surrounding the location. The body of Dr. James McGrogan would eventually be found by a group of skiers nearly four miles away, near the Booth Falls area. When experts got to the body, they noticed that Dr. James McGrogan was not wearing his coat, gloves or boots. When searching through his materials, the team found that he'd been fully equipped in the event of being lost, such as having a working cell phone in his backpack in an area with working cellular reception, a large pack of food, water and extra battery for his cell phone, basic medical supplies, an avalanche beacon, a working GPS and an extra set of warm clothing. When an autopsy was performed to uncover the cause of his passing, the details came back showing that Dr. James McGrogan was suffering from multiple injuries, including severe head trauma while wearing a helmet, trauma to the left side of his chest, and a completely broken femur. The cause of Dr. James McGrogan's passing was immediately ruled as an accident, and no further investigation was taken to explain the strange injuries, the vast amount of distance covered, or the fact that Dr. James McGrogan had failed to use any of his safety tools that could have easily helped him at a point during his journey if he'd been lost. Unfortunately, many of the rescuers would go on to claim that nothing was unusual with the finding of Dr. James McGrogan, claiming that he'd crossed over four and a half miles in a straight line, crossing over mountains and ridges without any climbing gear, only to fall off another mountain and accrue the injuries in different places all over his body, without shoes and while wearing his helmet. The complete disregard of uncovering the true nature of the passing of Dr. James McGrogan has only fueled continued paranoia when it comes to the growing disappearances of national parks and the theories surrounding missing people. 
So what do you make of these disappearances? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comment section below and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.